In today's series of videos, we'll be talking about a particular financial institution, which is essential to underlying the prosperity of modern developed states, and these are pension plans. In general, the prize of long life comes with certain kinds of complications, in particular, the question of how you'll continue to earn a living as we age. <clears throat> While some people manage to stay healthy well into their golden years, this isn't true of everyone, which means that people need to start making provisions against the possibility that they will still be alive, but unable to continue working. Now, the obvious solution to this problem is that people should save some of their earnings throughout their working life and invest it. But this, of course, requires people to still make an estimate about how long they're going to live and how much that they'll need to set aside. It also leaves open questions like what happens if you outlive your savings? <clears throat> and how should I invest these funds in order to guarantee that there will be sufficient amount of capital to support me in my old age? Now, <clears throat> one of the techniques that people have adopted for resolving this was to sell what were called life annuities. A life annuity was a contract in which an individual exchanged a fixed sum of cash for a series of cash payments over the remainder of their lives. The first of these we see, uh, recorded anyways, uh, <clears throat> begin to appear during the Roman imperial period around 220 AD. Private Roman financiers selling contracts that were called annua, uh, that were priced according to a very basic life table uh, that Domitius Ulpanius had assembled that allowed them to estimate roughly how long people were going to survive for and to <laughs> index this against the expected rates of return that they might earn on the sum of capital that people had invested. A thousand years later, by the medieval period, what we see is that a lot of small European cities who are forbidden from taxing people begin to raise cash for local projects by selling these same kind of life annuities. The first of these appears in Calais around 1260, but we also see them in Ghent and Flanders in the Low Countries appearing around 1280 to 1290. By 1494, 200 years later, these products are so widespread that they've actually led to significant financial problems in various Dutch cities, and several towns actually had to seek a reprieve from the government uh, on their legal obligations to make these payments because they had simply <clears throat> promised far more than they could actually meet. Now, one of the reasons for this was that until 1600s, the sellers of these life annuities only had the vaguest idea of how to estimate a fair price. They didn't distinguish between the lifespans of men or women, and they didn't tend to distinguish uh, the pricing based on how old you actually were. Uh, and this, of course, meant that there were opportunities for arbitrageurs to exploit states who were less sophisticated in setting prices appropriately. One particularly egregious example uh, would be the Trente Demoiselles de Genève. Uh, in this particular example, what we see is a group of Swiss financiers who has agreed to buy life annuities on a group of young girls who are the nominees. At this time, the beneficiaries of a contract do not need to be the same as the nominee, and therefore the beneficiaries were all the investors, while the nominee was someone who was expected to live for a very, very long time. And so as a result, the Trente Demoiselles de Genève were all very young French girls who had uh, came from families who had survived the plague who received private medical treatment and housing from these investors to ensure that their lives were as long as possible so that they could maximize the return that they earned on these kinds of certificates issued by various governments. <clears throat> now, the first time we start to see somebody actually resolving the seller's problem and helping to drain the, this problem away <clears throat> uh, was in 1671 when Dutch stadtholder uh, Johan de Witt or Jan de Witt uh, helped to reduce this issue uh, by actually properly estimating the risk of longevity by applying statistical sciences uh, <clears throat> to the estimation of these quantities. Now, this may allowed for a particular advance uh, whereby rather than simply in selling off contracts based off of an uncertain price, we could actually make a reasonable estimate about when people were expected to die, maybe not individually, but at least on a large number, which meant that if we were to sell life annuities to a group of 1,000 or 10,000 people, that we would have a somewhat predictable expected outflow of cash. And this sort of actuarial math would allow us to be able to set proper reserving requirements, and more importantly, would allow us to set appropriate prices for these annuities, such that the issuers weren't being shortchanged 
but that the purchasers were also not being shortchanged. Now, when you sell enough life annuities in this way, what you've effectively constructed is a pension plan. And every pension plan has a sponsor who sets membership parameters. In other words, they define who it is that will be able to collect a particular pension or not. Uh, from dating back to antiquity, looking at even in dating back to the Bronze Age, some states provided soldiers of particular military campaigns uh, with fixed stream of benefits. Sometimes these were even paid out to the uh, widows or orphans of people who had died on campaigns, but this was a lot rarer, frankly. As we move into the medieval period, we see that guilds and friendly societies sometimes provided a stream of financial support uh, in order to ensure that older members didn't fall into punery. Um, but what we, an interesting step we see is the beginnings of corporate sponsored pension plans uh, in the 1700s. And this was effectively taking the life annuity model that had been pioneered by these medieval towns and taking it one step further instead of simply selling off <clears throat> this kind of uh, product to individual investors, what they did was offered all the employees the a benefit of enrolling in a centrally coordinated plan that would invest their excess savings uh, <clears throat> while still offering them some kind of stream of benefits after they retired in exchange. Now, the first of these that we see in the 18th century is the Bank of England in 1793. They were followed by London and Northwestern Rail in the 1800s, Reuters in 1882, and North America's first corporate pension plan, uh, courtesy of the Grand Trunk Railroad in Canada, in 1874. Now, of course, <clears throat> these plans develop uh, a lot more complications and a lot more sophistication as we move forward in time, but it's useful for us to understand how important statistical sciences are to properly estimating the contributions that'll be required to offset the sorts of uh, hope to gain. And for that, we have Johan DeWitt to thank.